In order to gain an understanding of political philosophy, it would be useful to analyze a prominent Western philosopher to understand one view of the issue. Later, we will compare and contrast his beliefs with a prominent Eastern thinker, the Buddha, in order to have a broad range of opinion on the matter of politics and how it applies best to one's own beliefs and motivations. Let us look at the writings of Brian Berry, Professor Emeritus of Political Science who teaches at the London School of Economics. Berry earned his Ph.D. from Oxford University in 1964 and is the distinguished author of such books as Political Argument and the Liberal Theory of Justice. For his achievements, he was rewarded the Johann Skype Prize in Political Science in 2001. What follows is a summary of an article from International Society, Princeton University Press, 1999, in which Barry discusses a cosmopolitan theory of international society. There are two essential components to cosmopolitanism. It is an objective and all-inclusive political theory with global applications which holds that international institutions must be founded on an impartial consideration of how individuals in any nation are affected. More specifically, Barry makes the focus of this article so-called moral cosmopolitanism. As a political philosophy, moral cosmopolitanism is distinctive in its approach. It holds that membership in any particular society is of no importance, nor does it matter whether one is alive now or is a member of a future generation. When addressing world issues, all actions taken must be defensible from a global perspective. As Barry writes, at the heart of moral cosmopolitanism is the idea that human beings everywhere are in some fundamental sense equal. To Barry, justice is the highest order organizing concept within political philosophy. Based on this belief, he establishes four principles of justice that are consistent with moral cosmopolitanism. He uses these principles to provide a framework for applying cosmopolitanism to the world at large and in order to make clear his argument for using this theory to solve problems on a global scale. Barry's first principle is called the presumption of equality. The basis of this principle is that no one inherently deserves to do better than anyone else. He believes that inequality of rights, opportunities, and resources are maintained by, by unequal power relationships in which it is dangerous for those who have the least to try and change the status quo. He argues that if inequalities are to exist, that they must be justifiable to the less fortunate. Barry calls the second principle personal responsibility and compensation. It states that a person has a right to success because of personal choices, such as working long hours or choosing a dangerous profession. The compensation clause of this principle states that when an individual falls victim to an unpreventable misfortune, society has an obligation to help them unless the cost of aid outweighs the benefits. Barry's third principle, priority of vital interests, sets down basic human rights that we are all entitled to. Vital interests include security from physical harm, adequate nutrition to maintain health, access to clean drinking water, medical care, and education sufficient to support oneself in their society. These interests must be met in all cases worldwide in preference to anyone's non-vital interests. The fourth principle, mutual advantage, can be thought of as a bit of collective rationality. When the first three principles cannot work, what is best for society can be done. However, the fourth principle is merely a supplement to the first three and cannot supplant them. With his principles laid out, Barry demonstrates that these principles are being violated on a global basis. Justice is being denied to much of humanity. He believes that his third principle, vital interest, is being violated. A quarter of the world's population consumes vastly more than they need to sustain themselves while half of the Earth's population has unmet basic needs. Meanwhile, the gap between the rich and the poor is growing. Barry asks the question, is this denial of justice due to the application of his other principles? His answer is an unequivocal no. He discusses principle two, asking the question, if the poor and underdeveloped nations worked harder, could they then meet their vital needs? This is not the case. He believes that it is unrealistic to think that mere hard work can help individuals to escape their shanty towns. He discusses principle four, asking the question, is it in the best interest of everyone, or would it unfairly hurt the wealthy nations of the first world to change the status quo? He believes that this is not the case. 
not only would wealth transfers from the first to the third world not adversely affect those inhabitants of wealthy nations, but it would benefit the entire world by slowing production, thereby stemming the tide of environmental degradation worldwide. Having made this analysis, Barry comes to the following conclusion. The demands of cosmopolitanism would, I suggest, be best satisfied in a world in which rich people would be taxed for the benefit of poor people wherever they lived. How could the global community best implement a system of international redistribution? Barry proposes several ideas, but we will look at one of them, a model based upon the United States. Nations could be taxed by an international authority much like our federal government taxes its states. Nations would then be free to raise internal taxes to support their needs, much like our states tax their residents. Trans transfers to the impoverished could be made in two forms. The international community could devise a basic universal income to meet vital needs. Transfers could also be made indirectly in the form of communal facilities, with money being spent to build hospitals and schools in poverty-stricken areas. How feasible is Barry's proposed system of international redistribution? While this system would infringe upon the sovereignty of individual nations, he points out that to a certain extent such systems are already in place. For example, the European Union's member states pay into a central authority, just as it is better to be in the EU than on the outside looking in. He believes that all nations would benefit from taking part in his proposed system. Also troublesome is the process of assuring that transfers of wealth go to those who actually need them. Barry points to a modern day military interventions by the United States, by the United Nations, as an example. Governments that violate or steal transfers could be toppled and placed under international stewardship. Finally, Brian Barry believes that the case must continue to be made for implementation of the ideas of moral cosmopolitanism. He believes that political will must flow from the moral motivation to create a just and equitable global community. Now that we have looked at Brian Berry's cosmopolitan theory of international society, we will see what conclusions can be drawn from a comparison to his, of his theories to those of an Eastern philosopher. The Buddha believed that the wise should remain aloof from politics, for involvement in politics leads one to sorrow and strife. He believed that the only influence one should have in this matter is in setting a positive example for political leaders. It would seem that on this issue, Brian Berry and the Buddha share little common ground. Barry's career has been one of studying politics and of thinking of creative ways to reconcile inequality. Although he is not a politician per se, it is not by example but rather through the power of his ideas that he hopes to influence pol political leaders. Rather than remaining aloof from politics, he is fully immersed in them. From the Buddhist perspective, Barry has been entwined in sorrow and strife as he attempts to meet global injustices head on. I would certainly make the assumption then that Barry would disagree with the Buddhist ideas of separating oneself from the political sphere. Let us examine a bit closer the Buddha's own ideas. His own focus in life was, perhaps, conquering the problems of living and the roots of unhappiness. That is, he hoped to liberate himself from worldly desires and suffering. The Buddha's approach to ending suffering, then, was conquering problems associated with the self. What follows from this idea of influencing others through right action and through compassion towards others, no matter what the situation. Perhaps Barry's own ideas, too, are nested in the idea of compassion, as he seeks external solutions to problems, rather than the internal solutions that the Buddha sought. The point, then, is that although these two philosophers' approaches are different, they may be merely divergent paths to the self-same goal, that of alleviating human suffering. Now, with our analysis complete, the most important question left to answer is of personal nature, whose position more closely matches my own. While pol politics are indeed, as the Buddha believed, wrought with sorrow and strife, full of machinations and falsehoods, I would argue that politics are too important to completely dis disengage one's own self from the process. Politics are not some separate entity to be left to less enlightened people. They must be treated as an extension of one's own beliefs. I, like Brian Berry, believe that the current state of the world is not something that can be left to other people. There is sorrow and strife everywhere in our world. The Buddha believed that it could be eliminated within us, and the next logical step, it seems, would be to eliminate it outside ourselves. As Brian Berry believes, political will must flow from the moral motivation to eliminate suffering. 
While the Buddha declared that the wise must remain aloof from politics, I would argue that Brian Berry has quite a bit of wisdom himself. It is inherently uncomfortable to most to consider the scope of worldwide poverty, but I certainly believe that it is possible to be at peace with oneself even in the face of such daunting challenges. Whereas the Buddha believes that desire leads us to suffering, I believe that a search for realistic solutions to the problems that confront us is the best way to better our world. Although I am in almost complete agreement with various theories, perhaps they are not entirely feasible for the present push for globalization and free trade. The point is, a belief in justice is the cornerstone for not only personal enlightenment, but for an enlightenment of the global kind.